Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar. My name is Dr. Joseph DeBay. I'm a board-certified nutritionist practicing in Great Neck, New York. As you know, our topic this evening is tame your appetite and curb your cravings. Uh, on the control panel, that should be on the right side of your screen, there should be somewhere um, where you can type in a question. So if you would like to have a question answered, type that in, and I'll be looking at questions at the end of the webinar. Now when it comes to appetite and cravings, a lot of people think it's just a matter of willpower. And I'm not discounting willpower. You, you have to consciously make a decision that you want to make the right food choices, whether it's for your health or, or weight loss. But there's a lot, lot more to it than just willpower. What controls your appetite? Messages. Messages within the body that say things like, eat that donut or you're full, stop eating. These messages are communicated by chemicals, hormones, neurotransmitters or brain chemicals, and other molecules that change cell activities. The messages are received by receptors at the cell level. And the influence of food and diet is that the hormones, messaging molecules, and the receptors are made from the foods we eat. And components in food alter genetic expression and enzyme activity. And we'll, um, we'll be getting into this in a little more detail. So what can go wrong with this process of messaging in the body that can lead to excessive appetite and cravings? One thing is the wrong or unhealthy message can be sent. Too strong or too weak a message can be sent. So too strong a signal for increasing appetite. Too weak a signal for inhibiting your appetite. Another problem that can result is the message can be altered or garbled in transit. The message can be misheard or not heard at all by the cell. And, and hopefully in just a moment this will make more sense. A lot of what goes on to influence your appetite is controlled by the endocrine system. The endocrine system produces hormones that influence many different activities in the body, including your appetite. And this is a chart I learned in my healthcare education uh, about the components of the endocrine system. And the last time I checked, the book that contains this chart hadn't been updated, but it needs to be updated. There are more parts to the endocrine system than what are shown here. Uh, when it comes to endocrine disorders and weight, people typically think of the thyroid. But there are many other parts of the endocrine system, part of the brain, um, the pituitary gland, the adrenal glands, pancreas, ovaries, testes, and Body fat. Body fat produces quite a few biochemicals. These are some of the biochemicals that influence appetite. CRP and TNF-alpha, these are inflammatory chemicals. And inflammation influences your appetite. Cortisol is a stress hormone. That influences appetite. Resistant and leptin other hormones produced by the body fat. When a person has a lot of body fat, especially around the middle, the body fat becomes the loudest voice in the endocrine system. Muscle is another part of the endocrine system. The muscle produces biochemicals that influence the activity of the rest of the endocrine system. And the skeleton is part of the endocrine system. Bone produces hormones 
that influences the functioning of the pancreas and how well your insulin works, how efficiently you'll burn calories. And with, uh, with regard to the insulin, that's going to influence your appetite, as we'll see in just a minute. So if you have unhealthy bones, that can indirectly lead to problems with excessive appetite, believe it or not. The intestinal flora, the bacteria in the intestinal tract are also part of the endocrine system, and they influence your appetite as well. We each have about 100 trillion bacteria in the intestinal tract. Some of them are good for us, others not so good. When it comes to appetite, the, uh, the bacteria that are not good are ones that like to feed on meats primarily, fats I, I should say. There have been some really interesting studies with animals where they've uh, fed them high fat diets which has altered the type of bacteria in the intestinal tract and that increases the production of inflammatory chemicals that alters your endocrine system and it results in increased appetite. And then supplementing um, the good bacteria with the foods that they like increases their metabolic activity and they have a good effect on appetite. Prebiotics are uh, food for good bacteria and in animal studies feeding prebiotics caused an increase in the activity of the good bacteria and that in turn caused an increase in a hormone called glucagon-like peptide 1 and that has an effect of reducing appetite among other things a lot of beneficial effects so when it comes to your appetite you need to consider what's going on in your intestinal tract and a way to get um, a glimpse into what's going on in your intestinal tract is with a special laboratory test. This is called a gastrointestinal function profile. Uh, this is not the most pleasant sample to, to have taken. This is done from a stool specimen, but it gives a lot of great information. And you'll see there's a section called adiposity index. There are two families of bacteria that are measured with this test. And if you have an imbalance, like we see on this report, that's going to favor uh, unhealthy metabolism that can lead to increased appetite and increased weight. Okay, on to a slightly different subject. This is an animal study that looked at the influence of feeding hydrogenated oils to a pregnant mouse and it was found that the offspring had altered structure in the brain, the part of the brain called the hypothalamus that controls appetite and they had increased appetite. So during pregnancy uh, the mother's uh, environment including what the mother eats can have effects on the baby's appetite into adulthood. Cortisol and leptin are two very important hormones when it comes to weight loss and appetite. Cortisol increases appetite. Leptin tells the brain that you're full and that you should stop eating. So these hormones have opposing messages and cortisol can impair the functioning of leptin. Let me just mention briefly about cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone produced by the adrenal glands and it increases in response to all kinds of stress. Mental emotional stress, swings in blood sugar, tissue damage and inflammation. Those are the three biggest factors that can result in an increased cortisol and therefore increased hunger. Now leptin 
um, has an interesting history. When, when leptin was first discovered some years ago, uh, it was found that leptin is produced by fat cells. It tells the brain that you're full, you should stop eating. It tells the brain to increase your metabolic rate to burn more calories. So if you could take leptin in a pill, that should be a great thing for your appetite and for weight loss. And that's what drug companies thought. Drug companies were racing each other to come out with uh, some type of leptin drug until they did testing on humans and found that obese people had high leptin levels. So when it comes to leptin, it's a matter of, um, of balance. Uh, the reason obese people have a high leptin level is because they have leptin resistance. That means that the cells don't respond to the leptin signal to reduce appetite. So it's as if the leptin levels are actually low. If you have leptin resistance, your brain is functioning as if you don't have adequate leptin and your appetite doesn't become suppressed. So it's important that you have normal leptin levels and most importantly that the leptin function appropriately. So all things being equal, you don't want your leptin levels to be low, but then again, the cells need to respond to the leptin signal or it does no good. Lack of sleep has been found to have a bad effect on leptin and another hormone, ghrelin, and that combination is associated with increased hunger. So if you want to reduce your appetite, get a good night's sleep. Now we're going to talk about some of the things that result in leptin resistance over time. Eating sugar repetitively, a lot of sugar, causes spikes in leptin and then the cells begin to tune out the leptin signal and you wind up with leptin resistance. Altering that your dietary protein intake, increasing your protein, has a good effect on leptin sensitivity. As I mentioned, high cortisol contributes to leptin resistance. So does inflammation. CRP is an inflammatory protein which I routinely measure with my patients. It's mostly measured because it's an independent cardiovascular risk factor, like cholesterol. If it's high, you have an increased risk to cardiovascular disease. But in inflammation is involved with so much more than that. So CRP is a good indicator of inflammation in the body. Uh, in an animal study, CRP was found to inhibit leptin function. And that resulted in increased appetite. Fish oil helps to improve leptin functioning, and so does exercise. Um, beyond burning calories, exercise helps in a lot of ways with appetite and weight loss. This study is um, done in type 2 diabetics, and it's found that when they ate a, a meal cooked at high temperature, it resulted in lowered leptin levels. And that's not going to be good for appetite. So the temperature you cook your food at might have an influence on your appetite. If you eat more raw foods and uh, meats cooked um, at lower temperature and not cooked as long, it may have a beneficial effect on your appetite. A minute ago we were talking about inflammation. The types of fats we eat have a strong influence on the amount of inflammation in the body. Inflammation can be bad for your appetite, among other things. And the types of fat we eat can contribute to inflammation or reduce it. Arachidonic acid is a fatty acid found in beef, lamb, pork, dairy, egg yolks, shellfish, and it gets converted to pro-inflammatory chemicals in the body. EPA, which you find in fish oil, is converted to anti-inflammatory chemicals. 
and then there's uh, some plant-derived fatty acids you can take in supplemental form from borage seed oil that are also anti-inflammatory. So you can reduce your inflammation by changing the types of fat you eat and changing the supplements that you take. Okay, now we're on to um, a, compar a study that looked at a comparison between eating eggs for breakfast or eating bagels for breakfast. So there were two groups of people who consumed the same number of calories from eggs or bagels at breakfast and for the next 36 hours the food they ate was recorded and they were asked about their hunger. I, th I think they filled out uh, a special questionnaire to gauge uh, their appetite and it was found that there was a big difference in appetite and the amount of food consumed when people had eggs versus bagels for breakfast. For 36 hours after eating these foods there was a difference in appetite with less appetite after the egg breakfast compared to the bagel breakfast. And this is probably due to a couple of factors. One is eggs are high in protein and protein has a good effect on appetite. So you want to get protein throughout the day. You don't want to go too long without eating protein type of protein can make a difference too. Uh, I'm not going to get into that to try and keep things uh, from getting too complicated. But protein is very important. And the, the other factor in the study that's negative with regard to the bagel is the carbohydrate. Too much carbohydrate can have a bad effect on appetite. And that's related to something called the glycemic index. The glycemic index refers to how quickly a food raises your blood sugar. For a good appetite and for health, you want to have your sugar, your blood sugar, as stable as possible. Sugar is used by your cell, cells for energy. If your blood sugar dips, your brain is uh, one of the main organs that gets deprived of sugar, and that can lead to increased appetite and, and other uh, negative symptoms on your uh, effects on your concentration and mood. So glycemic index is a measure of how quickly a food can raise your blood sugar. So there have been studies done with um, different uh, quantities of food. I think, I think a test meal might be 50 grams of, of food. They feed it to people. They measure how much their blood sugar increases. And foods have been ranked by their glycemic index. So if you eat a food with a high glycemic index, that's going. To, that's a food that's going to raise your blood sugar rapidly, and, and that's not good for appetite. It has been postulated that obesity is related to glycemic index or glycemic load. The lower the glycemic index and load of the first meal, the less food is consumed in the subsequent meal. Glycemic load refers to how much carbohydrate is in a food. So if you have um, cup of carrots, it's got a fairly high glycemic index, but the amount of sugar in a cup is not that great. The glycemic load is, is not that high. So both these factors are important. The amount of carbohydrate in the serving that you're eating and how quickly it's converted to sugar. So studies have found the lower gl the glycemic index of a meal, the less food people wind up eating at the subsequent meal. Diets based on low-fat foods that produce a low glycemic response may enhance weight control because they promote satiety, minimize postprandial insulin secretion, and maintain insulin sensitivity. Several intervention studies in humans based on low glycemic index foods produced greater weight loss than did equivalent diets based on high glycemic index foods. When we eat food, our blood sugar goes up or, or glucose. When the glucose goes up, insulin goes up. The insulin transports the sugar into the cells. Then when your blood sugar comes down, other hormones are secreted to pick it back up, including glucagon, cortisol, epinephrine. Cortisol and epinephrine are stress hormones. So having a drop in your blood sugar is stressful. And if you feel anxious or stressed, 
half an hour, an hour or two after eating, it might be due to this process. It might be due to a drop in your sugar, causing your body to have to secrete stress hormones to pick your blood sugar back up. And the cortisol, like I mentioned before, increases appetite. Do you eat like a sumo wrestler? And I don't mean do you eat small children. Sumo wrestlers eat one big meal at the end of the day. That's their recipe for getting big and fat. There's a study that looked at the effect of um, drinking, drinking a sugar solution quickly or slowly on blood sugar, insulin, and fats in the blood. They gave people a 50-gram uh, sugar drink to consume in five minutes or to sip slowly over three and a half hours. When people sipped the sugar, their blood sugar increased minimally over time. When they drank it down quickly, there was a much greater spike in the blood sugar. Look what happened to the insulin. The group that sipped the sugar solution had a minimal increase in their insulin. It mirrored the blood sugar. The group that drank the sugar solution down quickly had a huge outpouring of insulin. Insulin is a fat-building hormone that interferes with the burning of fat and it has a lot of other negative effects when it's uh, chronically elevated. And, and here's uh, evidence of uh, increased fat in the blood, a little bit delayed, but a few hours after drinking that sugar solution, having that spike in insulin, the body's building more fat. A double gulp from 7-Eleven has 37 and a half teaspoons of sugar. 12 ounces of soda has about 10 teaspoons of sugar. How much sugar does a normal person have in their entire bloodstream? About one and a half teaspoons. So if you're drinking something with 37 and a half teaspoons of sugar or even 10 teaspoons of sugar, that's, a, that's quite a bit more than your body is meant to handle. That causes your body to have to produce huge amounts of insulin and when the body does that, it, it tends to overcompensate, and drop your blood sugar too low, and then you have to produce those other stress hormones to pick it back up. And when your blood sugar is dropping, your hunger is increasing. So when you eat a food that has a lot of sugar, a food that spikes your blood sugar rapidly, you wind up with high insulin levels. The insulin lowers your blood sugar, increases fat storage, you get increased hunger with the drop in your blood sugar and increased cravings for high glycemic index foods. So if your diet is high in glycemic index, you're going to be continually hungry. So one of the keys to controlling your appetite is to eat a low glycemic index diet. And that's what I teach my patients to do. I teach them how to design meals that are made up of low glycemic index foods. Oh, and something else I should have mentioned a minute ago with that study on the blood sugar and insulin <coughs> is um, it's important to eat frequently. You want to eat small, more frequent meals. Don't eat, <coughs> excuse me, don't eat like a sumo wrestler. Eat five or six times a day. Smaller quantities of carbohydrate spaced over the day. Here's a simple list of glycemic index of foods. There are other lists that are much more complete, but you know, this will give you a little idea of what we're talking about. So low glycemic index foods, which would be good for your appetite. Fruits, apples, berries, and cherries, barley, grapefruit, legumes, lentils, beans, nuts, unsweetened oatmeal, green peas, tomatoes, unsweetened plain yogurt. Then high glycemic index foods, candy, cookies, juices with added sugar, white potato, chips, sweetened cereal, sweetened soda, sweet snacks, white bread and bagels, white rice. Okay, then we also have glycemic load, the amount of carbohydrate in a serving of food. So about top on this list is the bagel at 56 grams as equivalent to, um, what is that, about um, 14 teaspoons of sugar? 
something like that, about 14 teaspoons of sugar. We should have about a teaspoon and a half in the bloodstream. Uh, as opposed to a cup of, bro cup of broccoli, 4.6 grams of carbohydrate. What a difference. So you want to eat foods that um, don't have a huge amount of carbohydrate and that have a lower glycemic index. Insulin response increases dramatically beyond 50 grams of carbohydrate per meal. So one bagel and you're there. There's a study that compared the effects on appetite of three different breakfasts and lunches in teenage boys. So they, they ate um, the same food for breakfast and lunch on three different days. On the three different days, what they ate was, was different. Uh, there was a, a low glycemic index day, a medium glycemic index day, and a high glycemic index day. After lunch, the boys uh, <coughs> remained at the laboratory. Um, I'm not sure what kind of setting it was. That maybe it was a cafeteria. But, but they, had, um, they had access to, to food. They could eat freely for five hours after lunch. And it was found on the, on the day they had the high glycemic index meals, they wound up eating 81% more calories compared to the day they had the low glycemic index meals. So more evidence that the glycemic index has a major effect on appetite. Another subject I just want to mention briefly, um, you know, I've heard, heard people talk about the benefits of uh, drinking a lot of water. And finally, I came across a study that shows that drinking water actually reduced appetite. Women drinking eight glasses of water a day consume less calories than women who can consume less water. Okay, now we're on to uh, um, a discussion of a study that was done in animals on the effect of sugar. So this researcher took baby mice and had them con uh, sign their consent forms and then he put them on a hot plate and measured how long they would stay before they jumped off. And they stayed an average of 10 seconds before they jumped off the hot plate. So after 10 seconds, their feet were getting painful, they jumped off. Then he repeated the experiment, and this time before he put them on the hot plate, he gave them a sugar solution to drink. And this time, it took 20 seconds before they jumped off the hot plate. Then he repeated the experiment with the sugar solution, but this time he gave them a medication in addition, something that blocks beta endorphin receptors in the brain. Endorphins are feel-good brain chemicals. And this time the sugar didn't work. They only stayed on the hot plate for eight seconds. Then there was another experiment done. The baby mice were separated from their mothers and the number of times they cried in a six-minute period was counted and they cried an average of 300 times. Then again, the experiment was repeated after the mice were given a sugar solution. And this time, they only cried 75 times. And again, the experiment was repeated with the sugar solution and the beta endorphin blocker. And they went back to crying 300 times in the six minute period. So the conclusion is that sugar stimulates the release of beta endorphin and therefore relieves both emotional and physical pain. So some people take uh, prescription medication for pain, for um, depression. Some people eat to relieve physical and emotional pain. Sugar influences our, our emotional state. Sugar is a drug, an external substance acting through the brain and body on cellular receptors designed for an internal chemical called glucose. Sugar increases circulating levels of beta endorphin and serotonin. 
Serotonin is a brain chemical. A lot of people take medications to manipulate. With serotonin deficiency, you can have anxiety, depression, anger, insomnia, and increased appetite. If you have low levels of serotonin, you often wind up craving sugar. If the overall quality of your health is poor, it is unlikely that your mental functioning and emotional well-being will fare any better. A powerful incentive for binge eating and a source of sugar cravings is the effort to counter depression and mood swings. So we self-medicate with food. Another way to affect the serotonin in a healthier way, rather than binging on sugars to boost your serotonin, is to take a supplement. This is something to consider. Something called 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP. Uh, there were a couple of studies that were done in diabetics finding the same same result that supplementing with 5-HTP significant, significantly decreased their daily energy intake, reducing carbohydrate and fat, and resulting in weight loss. 5-HTP reduced appetite, and the reason why, I'm sure, is because 5-HTP is converted to serotonin. So like I mentioned, people take uh, antidepressants, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Paxil, Pro, Prozac, Zoloft, many other medications that influence serotonin levels in the brain. Serotonin is made from tryptophan. Tryptophan is found in the diet. So if you're not eating enough tryptophan, that could be the cause of low serotonin. Tryptophan is found in protein. So if you're eating a low protein diet, that might have an effect on low serotonin and increased carbohydrate cravings. What carbohydrate does, sugar, spikes your insulin levels and insulin helps to transport tryptophan into the brain and once it's in the brain it can be converted to 5-HTP and then on into serotonin. So when people eat these um, high sugar foods they feel good afterwards because of the influence on tryptophan and serotonin, at least in part. For, this to for the conversion to happen, you also need nutrients. You need vitamin B3, vitamin C, iron, folic acid, magnesium, vitamin B2, vitamin B6. So if you're lacking in any of these nutrients, that could be the reason for your low serotonin and your carbohydrate cravings. Additionally, you need DHA, which is found in fish oil, for the brain cells to receive the serotonin signal. And there's other influences on, on serotonin production. You could be consuming all the right nutrients in your diet, but if you have maldigestion or malabsorption, that can result in low serotonin. If you have bacterial overgrowth in your intestinal tract, they can gobble up some of the nutrients that go into making serotonin. Heavy, heavy metals like uh, mercury and lead can interfere with the serotonin release in the brain cells. Stress poisons serotonin metabolism in a number of ways, and inflammation, overactivity of the immune system, also results in lowered serotonin levels. I just want to mention this briefly. I forgot to left this slide in. A uh, study was done comparing the effects of two proteins, one called casein, one called whey, on hunger, and there was a difference. So it's not just the amount of protein you eat, but the type of protein, the whey protein, was superior for suppressing appetite. So this is something to consider, especially if you're not eating enough protein. Taking a whey protein supplement uh, as, as a meal replacement or prior to meals can help to reduce your appetite and your food intake. Okay, a little bit about exercise. This is a study that compared the effects of aerobic exercise and resistance exercise on hunger. And the exercise altered biochemicals in the body that influence appetite. Both types of exercise suppressed hunger, but the aerobic exercise was more effective. If you don't want fat on your body, don't eat fat, right? Not necessarily. Here's a quote from a study looking at uh, fats. 
Modifications in dietary fat profile have been shown to affect body weight gain and adiposity. Omega-3 fatty acids have a lot of beneficial effects when it comes to weight loss and one of the effects is decreasing appetite. Here's a study that came to that conclusion. A diet rich in long-chain omega-3 fatty acids modulates satiety in overweight and obese volunteers during weight loss. And the best source for these fatty acids is cold water fish, salmon, mackerel, sardines, or fish oil supplements. So what can you do to reduce your appetite? Don't skip meals. Eat frequently. Skipping meals leads to increased production of cortisol and gluconeogenesis, which means the production of sugar from proteins in your body. If you go too long without eating, your body secretes cortisol, which turns your protein, primarily your muscle, into sugar. That's not good. If you lose muscle, you're not going to burn as many calories. You're more prone to put fat on. Eat frequently. Uh, three small meals and two to three snacks daily. Uh, consider using a high quality meal replacement product. I, I recommend some of those with my patients. Makes it a little bit more convenient in, in eating uh, five or six times a day. Eat mostly whole unrefined foods. Fill up on low glycemic vegetables like broccoli, celery, cauliflower. Eat a lot of salads. Uh, if you're going to party, don't go hungry. Uh, it shouldn't be many hours since your last meal. You should have some vegetables, may maybe salad with uh, olive oil, which slows emptying of food from your stomach shortly before it, you go to uh, a function where there's going to be a lot of tempting foods. If you're hungry, you're more likely to make the wrong choices. Eat omega-3 rich fish and or take high quality fish oil supplements. Don't drink your cal calories, avoid soda and juice. Drink green tea, that could be have a beneficial effect. Limit saturated fats, which you find in animal products and I recommend totally avoiding hydrogenated oils, which you find in uh, all kinds of uh, packaged prepared foods, even breads. Get adequate sleep. Practice stress reduction, get ad adequate sunlight exposure. Um, sunlight allows your body to make uh, adequate amounts of serotonin. But one reason why people tend to have uh, more cravings in the evening is because uh, serotonin levels drop. If you, if you have sunlight exposure, uh, your serotonin levels will uh, be maintained. And maybe consider some supplements. There are many that actually have some some research in controlling appetite, whey protein, and 5-HTP are a couple we touched upon. And a little bit about exercise. So tell me, Mr. Smith, what fits better into your daily routine? One hour of exercise or 24 hours of dead? Exercise is important. And I always recommend tailoring things. So I, I gave you a lot of uh, general information that can help uh, the average individual, but everyone's unique. Uh, and Some people need uh, a very different approach. And to lead to a personalized approach, you need to have a good, thorough, functional medicine workup, uh, which primarily involves specialized testing to get a glimpse into your biochemistry and your metabolism to see what's causing your appetite and cravings to be excessive. For those of you who haven't seen my website, this is the home page. I recommend you check it out. I have a lot of information there. DrDebay.com. You can sign up for my newsletter if uh, you're not on the list already. And I'll be giving more webinars in the future, probably uh, in a couple of weeks. I'll be doing another webinar. I'll, I'll be sending out an, an announcement uh, shortly what the topic will be. Okay, let me see if we have any questions. No questions now. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, there's a place to type that in uh, on the panel on the right. I'll give it a few minutes before we end the webinar. If anybody would like to 
ask a question, I'll read it and provide the answer. Okay, no response. I hope everyone's not asleep. Thank you for attending. And you can always uh, contact me by email if you think of questions later. Okay, we, we do have uh, one question now before we uh, finish up. Uh, the question is, what is leptin? Okay, I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. Leptin is, uh, is one important hormone when it comes to appetite. Uh, I don't think we should single out any single biochemical as being the key to appetite, but, but leptin is one with um, important research behind it. Leptin is produced by fat cells, and it circulates in the blood, goes to the brain, and tells your, your brain that you're full, tells your brain to shut off the appetite. So if you don't have adequate leptin, that's not going to be good for your appetite. You don't wind up with increased appetite. But what's been found with obese people is that they often have elevated leptin. And the reason is that they have leptin resistance. The brain cells are not responding to the leptin signal. So when it comes to um, hormones and neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters are the messaging chemicals in the body, it's a, the uh, net effect is a result of a lot of factors, including the level of the hormone and the sensitivity of the cells that receive the instructions from that hormone. So if the brain cells are tuning out the leptin signal, it's like the leptin isn't there. So if you have a measurement of your leptin levels, yeah, your, your doctor has to uh, interpret that for you. Uh, if you're obese and your leptin is high, yeah, the conclusion is, as far as I'm concerned, you have leptin resistance. Your leptin's not working well. So you need to take steps to get your brain responding to the leptin signal again. And those steps I covered are increase, consider increasing your protein. This should really be tailored, depending on what's going on with you. Increase your protein, exercise, get adequate sleep, maybe measure your cortisol levels. If they're elevated, take steps to lower the cortisol. Uh, reduce your sugar intake, take fish oil supplements. Those are some of the important things to get your leptin working properly. Okay, now we have a bunch of other questions. Let's see. Um, is there a certain amount of time you should stop eating before you go to bed? Uh, you know, uh, I haven't seen anything scientific on that. It probably exists. Uh, I haven't come across it. I think it's probably a good idea to wait a few hours before you go to sleep. Sometimes I make an exception. If somebody wakes up in the middle of the night, it often can be because there's a drop in the blood sugar. And in that situation, they sometimes benefit from having a, a snack before bed, particularly uh, one that contains some protein to help stabilize the blood sugar. Why do some diets restrict or reduce coffee and caffeine? Well, as far as appetite, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if um, coffee or caffeine restriction is done in connection with uh, appetite, which is what we're talking about tonight. But yeah, there's other reasons for restricting coffee or caffeine. Coffee has, actually has a lot of health benefits, but uh, there's some potentially adverse effects of coffee too. You know, if, you, if, you get, if you get too much caffeine, uh, yeah, that, that can stimulate your sympathetic nervous system too much. That, that can actually result in high cortisol, too much caffeine. And uh, obviously can affect your sleep. That's not good. You know, whether you need to totally eliminate coffee in any given situation, I don't know. I'm, I'm reluctant to tell people not to drink coffee at all since I love it personally. But uh, you know, in excess, it definitely could produce some ill effects. Do you recommend eating a mix of healthy fats and proteins to lower the glycemic index? Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, I should have, uh, should have stressed that. Uh, the glycemic index of your meal is really the important thing. It's not 
just the individual components. You, you don't just pay attention to the carbohydrate. You shouldn't be eating just carbohydrate-rich foods like a potato by themselves. Uh, you should be eating mixed meals that contain protein and fat. Uh, proteins you, know, you find in animal products, meats, uh, chicken, fish, turkey, lean beef, eggs, uh, dairy products. You find protein in legumes, beans, peas, and lentils, a little bit of protein in nuts. And uh, some of those foods come with a good amount of fat. And then there's uh, other types of healthy fats you can add to meals, olive oil, olives, avocado nuts. Those are some healthy fats. And those things uh, affect the glycemic index. Olive oil slows the emptying of food from your stomach, uh, and that's good for slowing the absorption of sugar. Amino, amino acids compete with uh, sugars for absorption. That slows the absorption of uh, sugar into your bloodstream, the, the spike in your blood sugar. So definitely it's a good idea to have a mixture of foods at most meals. If you roast vegetables at high temperature for 40 minutes, does it negatively impact their benefits? Uh, yeah, I think you're probably uh, referring to what I talked about with um, the diabetic study where there was a reduction in um, leptin levels by consuming uh, foods cooked at high temperature. And that's much more of a factor with animal products, with meats less of a factor with vegetables. Uh, there's some effect with vegetables, but um, I think it's minuscule in comparison to the meats. Cooking temperature is the biggest factor. Second biggest factor is cooking time. Uh, cooking method makes a difference. If you cook with water, there's less of a negative impact. So if you boil and poach, that has uh, less of a negative effect than if you cook with dry heat like uh, Boiling or, or baking. Uh, then there's also spices that can help with, um, with this process. Um, cinnamon and uh, cloves and rosemary. And there's some other ones. And there's also a number of nutritional supplements, a special form of vitamin B1 called benfotiamine, and, and several other supplements. Uh, green tea as well help to inhibit the negative effect of uh, eating foods cooked at high temperature. Okay, another question. Just to make sure I understood it correctly, is a breakfast with bagel more energy than a breakfast with eggs? Um, not sure I understand your question. You can ask it again if I, if I don't. But the uh, study I referenced was um, two breakfasts. Uh, containing the same number of calories and actually the same weight of food. One breakfast was bagels, the other breakfast was eggs. Uh, they supplied the same number of calories at breakfast and then they just looked at um, the influence on appetite and the bagels had uh, a bad effect on increasing appetite compared to the eggs. Are there any recommendations for ulcerative colitis and other inflammatory bowel problems? Sugar and abnormal flora a contributor. Oh, I, I, I definitely think so. Yeah, th this is really not on the topic of appetite, but yeah, flora can play a big role in inflammatory bowel diseases. I'll be doing a talk on autoimmune diseases in the future, and inflammatory bowel disease is one of the autoimmune diseases. Is the information you covered tonight on your website, you covered a lot of great information, just a lot to remember. Um, no, unfortunately, uh, it's not. Uh, it's, you know, it's definitely not in this format. Although, if this recording went OK, I'll be posting this webinar that you just watched on my website, so you'll be able to watch it again. Uh, I would refer you to a couple of articles I've written that touch on some of these topics. Uh, one is called reversing the number one cause of illness, obesity, and accelerated aging. And that's got to focus on um, blood sugar, insulin, and cortisol. And looks like that was the last question. We'll, I'll uh, give it a minute if anybody would like to 
ask any other questions. And like I mentioned, you can always email me, inquiry, I-N-Q-U-I-R-Y, at D-R-D-E-B-E dot -E com. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for attending. And I'll be uh, sending out an invitation for my next webinar. Have a great night. Bye-bye.